podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. First of all, um, thanks to the uh, organizers for hosting this conference and also for inviting me to speak. And I thought that since my talk will pr perhaps be the most old-fashioned talk at the conference, uh, I should explain just for a moment before I start why uh, I've chosen to revisit superstring perturbation theory. Uh, so it's a subject which is largely clear, and one can only aim to clarify details. That's all I've been aiming to do. But it is one of the foundations of our subject. And the fact that superstring perturbation theory does work is one of the most important reasons to have confidence that there actually is a theory that exists that all this effort is going into exploring. Of course, 25 years ago, it was essentially the only reason. And nowadays, there are other reasons. For example, nowadays, there's a web of non-perturbative results whose inner consistency is an equally con convincing reason, perhaps, to believe that a real theory exists. And a third branch of the tripod, or a third leg of the tripod, would perhaps be the rich interrelationships of string theory with other areas of science and math and the way it's generated many other ideas. But the inner consistency of superstring perturbation theory is an important leg of the tripod. And that's why I've uh, chosen to revisit it, even though one can only aim to understand details better. Now, we're not going to have anything to say about ultraviolet questions, because there aren't any. Uh, modular invariance eliminates the ultraviolet region from superstring perturbation theory, even though people didn't realize this right away. It was another decade after modular invariance was discovered, for example, before the first completely consistent one-loop calculations were done by uh, Green, Schwartz, and Brink. But from our perspective now, there are no ultraviolet questions because of modular invariance. But the literature from the 80s left some small unclarity about the, the infrared behavior. And this is what we want to revisit. First of all, the general statement one wants to establish is simply that the infrared behavior of superstring perturbation theory is the same as that of a field theory with the same massless particles and low energy interactions. But there are some details of this that could be explained more fully than has been done in the past. So I want to first give a couple of examples of what I mean in saying that the infrared behavior of string theory is the same as that of a corresponding field theory. Let's consider a Feynman diagram. One of the simplest questions of infrared behavior is to ask what happens when a single propagator goes on shell. First, we'll consider a propagator whose cutting does not separate a diagram in two. So actually, here's a diagram, and I've labeled two internal lines. One is a generic one, and two is a little bit special. So the most infrared singular case will be that of massless particles. The propagator of a massless particle is 1 over k squared. Indeed, on compact dimensions, the infrared behavior when the momentum in a single propagator goes to 0 is what I've written. And this converges if d is bigger than 2. Now, that was the infrared behavior for a generic internal line. For an exceptional one, like this one, you see, with the is particle on shell, if this momentum goes to 0, this particle can also be on shell. So in that, and also this one, in that configuration, the infrared behavior is worse, and you can get infrared divergences up to d equals 4. Those are the usual on-shell divergences of QED. Now, everything I've said has a close analog in string theory. First of all, a non-separating line that goes to zero momentum is analogous to a non-separating divergence of a Riemann surface, where a tube in a Riemann surface is getting pinched and becomes very narrow, or conformally, that's equivalent to saying it becomes very long, but in such a way that the whole surface doesn't divide in two. And mathematically, you can describe this by an equation, x, y equals q, where x is a local complex parameter on one side, in other words, back here, y is a local parameter over here, and q goes to 0 in the limit that the neck becomes very narrow. Or by a conformal transformation, log q is the length of the tube separating the two sides. Now, the contribution of a massless string state propagating through the neck is given by a standard formula. 
which for massless string states we can write this way. And instead of doing the integral, we can actually compare to field theory by introducing the analog of a Schwinger parameter. We write Q as the exponential of minus something, where T plays the role of the Schwinger parameter of field theory. And after integrating over S, we get something that I've written like so. And on the T integral, I only wrote the upper limit, which is infinity, not the lower limit. The reason is that the lower limit is affected by modular invariance uh, and does not affect the infrared behavior. The fact that modular invariance removes the lower limit or shifts it away from where it would be in field theory is the statement that there's no ultraviolet region in string perturbation theory. But modular invariance doesn't affect the upper limit, which is where infrared singularities arise. So what we got here agrees with field theory even before doing any integrals if we bear in mind that the Schwinger representation of the Feynman propagator looks like so. So, um, OK, I already explained this. Just as in field theory, we can consider special cases where one momentum going to zero puts other lines on shell. And we'll get the same infrared divergences, whether in field theory or string theory. There are a lot of other questions that match in a straightforward way between string theory and field theory. For something where the match is less straightforward, let's consider a separating line. And now I've drawn two cases in field theory. If we cut the indicated line, the diagram splits in two. The difference is that in the second case, the external momenta are all on one side of the separating degeneration. Now, in this case, either way, we don't integrate over the momentum that passes through the separating line. It's determined by momentum conservation to be the total momentum flowing in from the right or flowing out through the left. But the difference between the two cases is that this momentum is zero here because nothing is flowing in on the right, whereas here it's non-zero generically. So on the left, the momentum flowing through the indicated line, the separating line, is generically non-zero. So typically, we're not sitting on the 1 over k squared singularity of that propagator. When we vary the external momenta, we can meet that singularity, and that will give a pull in S matrix elements, at least in this approximation. The pull is physically sensible. We don't want to get rid of it. So here, there's a singularity, but it's part of the physical interpretation of the theory. But here, we're, we actually are sitting on top of the pull, and that isn't physically sensible. On the right, since the momentum flowing through the indicated line is 0, we're going to get 1 over 0 unless the diagram actually vanishes. So therefore, a field theory with a massless scalar has a sensible perturbation expansion only if the so-called tadpole, or one-point function of the scalar, vanishes. This thing on the right is meant to be the number 0, not a one-loop Feynman diagram. <laughs> <coughs> We have to impose this condition for all massless scalars, but it's only non-trivial for some of them. In field theory, if the tadpoles vanish, we just throw away all the tadpole diagrams and compute the amplitude by summing the other diagrams. Now, all this is relevant to superstring perturbation theory, because whenever we do have a perturbative string theory, there's always at least one massless neutral scalar to worry about, namely the dilaton. So perturbative string theory only makes sense if the dilaton tadpole vanishes. In either field theory or string theory, the usual way to show that the tadpole vanishes is to use supersymmetry. But actually, without supersymmetry, the question doesn't usually arise. Because without supersymmetry, it's unnatural to have a massless neutral scalar, except in the case of Goldstone bosons, where then you would use the underlying spontaneously broken symmetry to prove the absence of the tadpole. Just as in field theory, we can distinguish different kinds of diagrams with separating degenerations. Now the red dot is an external vertex operator. Here are two different separating degenerations. But from what I've told you, it's the one on the right where all the external vertex operators are on the same side. So the momentum flowing through the neck is 0. That's going to cause trouble. There are two reasons that this problem is harder to deal with than in field theory. The first is that technically it's harder to understand space-time supersymmetry in string theory than in field theory, 
and use it to show that the integrated tadpole vanishes. Also, in field theory, the tadpoles are the contributions of certain diagrams, and if they vanish, we just throw them away. But string theory is more subtle because it's more unified. The tadpole is part of a diagram that also has non-zero contributions. For example, in oriented closed string theory, there only is one diagram of G loops. So if we were to throw it away, we'd be throwing away everything. When the tadpole vanishes, the diagrams of string perturbation theory only become conditionally convergent. And there's still a little bit of work to do. That's one point where what was done in the 80s can be clarified, but we won't go in that direction today. Since we can only hope for the tadpole to vanish in the supersymmetric case, we have to do superstring theory. So our Riemann surfaces are really super Riemann surfaces. And that's actually a slightly subtle notion, at which it takes some practice to get intuition about them. And I can't really describe it today. I won't describe it today. I've got one slide where I've written one or two sentences, but there won't really be time to explain it. A super Riemann surface is a super manifold with one comp even and one odd complex dimension that has some special structure, a super conformal structure. And uh, part of that structure is that you can have singularities associated to Ramon vertex operators. And Friedan, Martin, and Schenker in 1985 explains what kind of vertex operators are inserted at such singularities. They're often called spin fields, and how to compute their operator product expansions. In particular, the operators that generate space-time supersymmetry are of this kind. So their work made it possible to see space-time supersymmetry in a covariant fashion in superstring theory. <clears throat> For their work also made possible many practical calculations. And the main ideas of superstring perturbation theory were well understood in that period. There only are a few details, as I said before, that merit being understood more, more precisely. To understand the reason that there are some details that perhaps weren't fully clarified in the early period is that doing so requires a little more sophistication with supermanifolds and integration than is usually needed in other problems in supersymmetry and supergravity. <clears throat> so some low order cases are deceptively simple and don't give a good idea of a general algorithm. For example, in genus one, the dilaton tadpole vanishes by summing over spin structures. But the fact that this makes sense depends upon the fact that in genus one, there are no fermionic moduli. As soon as there are odd moduli, there's no notion of two super Riemann surfaces being the same but with different spin structures. So you can't sum over spin structures. All you can do is integrate over the moduli space. In, in genus two, Docker and Fong found an effective and very beautiful way to integrate over fermionic moduli, after which they could integrate over spin structures, sum over spin structures. And their calculation is currently the gold standard. But for generic G, their procedure has no analog, and the only operation is a combined integral over all bosonic and fermionic moduli. Actually, Ron Donaghi and I are writing a paper with a precise theorem concerning one version of the statement here. But I won't explain either the statement or its proof today. Instead of talking about what doesn't work in general, let's discuss what does work. First of all, there's a natural measure on supermoduli space. Not only is there a natural measure, but it was constructed in a variety of ways in the 80s. Some better known than others, but anyway, all perfectly good. Another key point is that integration of a bounded measure on a compact supermanifold is a well-defined operation just as on an ordinary manifold. That fact that integration on a compact supermanifold is well-defined is a fundamental piece of the story, but it's not the whole story because supermoduli space is not compact, or if we take its compactification, then the measure we want to integrate has singularities, precisely because of the infrared effects that we're trying to understand. So the limit where this neck becomes very long or where it collapses 
you can either say that moduli space is not compact there or that the measure has a singularity there. But either way, we're not integrating a uh, compact, uh, sorry, a smooth measure on a compact supermanifold. So we need a little bit more, but still it's uh, basic for orientation that the super that on a compact space, there'd be no problem with integration. So the only delicacies involve the infrared behavior. Although supermoduli space is very subtle, if you ask precisely the questions whose answers you need, those questions tend to have simple answers. If you ask a question whose answer you don't need, you tend to be in for a world of pain. It's only the questions whose answer you actually need that tend to have simple answers. For example, although a sum over spin structures does not make sense in general, a small piece of it makes sense in the infrared region. And this leads to the GSO projection on the physical states that propagate through the node, or singularity. For another example, and this is important vis-a-vis -vis what I said a moment ago about the fact that we're actually not integrating on a compact supermanifold, the description of the behavior near the singularity is just as simple, or almost as simple, as for a bosonic Riemann surface. In the bosonic case, gluing is described by this formula I already wrote. And in the super case, there's an almost equally simple formula, which for brevity I'm only writing in the Neuver Schwartz case. Importantly, it only depends on one bosonic parameter, Q in one case and epsilon in the other case. In the super case, there are no odd moduli for the gluing. That's important in clarifying a few of the details that were not completely clarified in the 80s. Among other things, what I've just explained is the fundamental reason that there's no integration ambiguity in superstring theory. There's a good parameter at infinity. Now, let's discuss integration by parts on supermoduli space. We need integration by parts to prove the decoupling of pure gauge degrees of freedom and to prove space-time supersymmetry and vanishing of tadpoles. This is actually one place where what was done in the 80s can be improved. But I should say that some of this was actually done by uh, Andrei Belopolsky in papers of the 90s that unfortunately are a little known. I see the again is a little bit wrong because I, oh, maybe I did earlier have a, I forgot to mention it, but I think on one of the slides I might have mentioned these papers. Traditionally, arguments involving odd moduli and integra involving integration by parts were made by first integrating over odd moduli and then using the bosonic version of Stokes' theorem. But that attempt, the attempt to do things in that way is actually what leads to the complications that made the literature of the 80s a little bit untransparent. There's a perfectly good super analog of Stokes' theorem, and it's best to use this. You probably all know the basic idea of fermionic integration by parts, which is that if alpha is an odd variable and f of alpha is any function, then the integral of a total derivative is zero. In fact, Berezin defined, defined his integral precisely to make this true. There is a supermanifold of version of Stokes' theorem, which roughly combines the ordinary bosonic Stokes' theorem with a souped-up version of what I just told you. So there isn't time to explain exactly, but I'll just tell you what it says. Well, first you need to define the appropriate objects, which are the supermanifold analog of differential forms. They're similar to differential forms, except that in describing them, there's one unavoidable new concept, which is picture number. Unfortunately, I can't really explain it today. But once one has the right definitions, the supermanifold version of Stokes' theorem says just what you would expect it to say by analogy with the ordinary one. Here, lambda is a form of codimension one, and therefore d lambda is a top form or volume form. Now, a scattering amplitude is associated with a volume form that's supposed to be integrated over a supermoduli space. The idea of the proof of gauge invariance is the same as it is for the bosonic string. We assume that all of our vertex operators, V1 up to Vn, are BRST invariant, but we assume that one of them is actually pure gauge. So that V1, for example, 
is Q anti-commuted with some W. In that case, if you've set things up properly, then in that case, there's an analog of the statement that you have in the bosonic extreme, namely the form whose integral would be the scattering amplitude is d lambda for some lambda, where lambda in this case is actually an integral form of co-dimension one. So when you're checking that Q with W decouples, well, the way it couples would be an integral over, roughly speaking, moduli space of the form epsilon, but by the supermanifold version of Stokes' theorem, that's the integral over the boundary of gamma of lambda, and therefore, if lambda vanishes on the boundary of gamma, the right-hand side vanishes, and so therefore does the left-hand side. So therefore, anomalies can only involve the infrared behavior. So roughly speaking, to show that the anomalies vanish, you need to know the vanishing of tadpoles. Otherwise, none of the, what we're discussing makes sense. And you need a certain condition on mass renormalization that we'll sort of incorporate in a bit. So, um, <clears throat> <see. clears throat> the argument I just gave, I mean, it's the right argument to aim for. It's the argument one makes for the boson extreme. And I claim that if you set up the right definitions, then you have an argument of exactly the same form for superstring theory. Uh, what was generally done in the 80s and said, again, Bolopolsky in the 90s is an exception, but what was mostly done in the 80s was to try to reduce to the bosonic version of Stokes' theorem. It's not wrong, but it makes the arguments extremely untransparent. Now, the proof of gauge invariance has an important corollary. If one knows that the massless tadpoles vanish, then so that the amplitudes make sense then space-time supersymmetry is a special case of the decoupling of pure gauge modes. This may be deduced from an argument that is valid in string theory, but it's totally unstringy. We consider a scattering amplitude involving a soft gravitino. So um, we take its wave function to be a plane wave times a uh, polarization object which has both a vector and spinner index, so I call it eta i alpha. The matrix element for emission of a soft gravitino has singular terms where the gravitino is attached to an external line. You see, if, so, if k is near zero and p is on shell, then p minus k is also almost on shell, and therefore, this propagator is almost on shell and there is a singularity. So I've drawn this as a uh, field theory picture but from what I said at the beginning, hopefully you all realize that there's an analogous string theory picture where this almost one shell line would be a, um, uh, would involve a Riemann surface that's almost degenerating with uh, a narrow neck. The line that emits the gravitino is just slightly off shell, so um, with momentum p minus k. So p squared, the external momentum was one shell, k squared is zero. So p minus k squared is m squared minus 2k dot p. And the propagator for that external line is minus 1 over 2p dot k. Well, I've written that in the spinless case. There's something similar in a more general case where the external particle has spin. 1 over p dot k is singular as k goes to 0. The amplitude also has a numerator, which is a matrix element of the supercurrent between the external line and the internal line that it couples to. So without writing a formula, we'll just say there's a matrix on it. So the soft emission amplitude is a matrix element divided by the singular factor times an amplitude in which the external gravitino is removed and the external particle is replaced by this other particle, p minus k, whose spin is different because it's what you get by acting on P with the supercurrent. Now, if the gravitino polarization vector spinner is longitudinal, in other words, if its vector part is proportional to the momentum, then the whole amplitude must vanish. That's what gauge invariance says. This is a special case of the decoupling of BRST trivial states. <clears throat> 
It's hard to evaluate this condition exactly, but we can evaluate its leading behavior as k goes to zero by summing up the most singular contributions to the amplitude and asking that they should be gauge invariant. The sum of all of these terms must vanish, and this is the word identity of space-time supersymmetry. <clears throat> so this is a field theory argument. I gave the references a little bit ago. It works the same way in string theory, except that when you make this argument, you assume that your amplitudes exist. So in the context of string theory, it means you have to know that the massless tadpoles vanish. And once you know that, it's true that d the uh, va decoupling of the longitudinal gravitino implies space-time supersymmetry. Well, it implies it modulo one more point that we should make, which is that in either field theory or string theory, there's a possible failure mode. The failure mode is that there might be one more singular term as k goes to zero if the gravitino couples through some loop effect to another massless uh, fermion, which might be either itself or else a massless fermion is going to half. This happens, well, obviously this doesn't happen at tree level. If it happened at tree level, psi wouldn't be massless. The, the theory wouldn't have been a supersymmetric theory, and we wouldn't have been having this discussion. So the failure mode is that such an, a coupling might be induced by loop effects. So if loop effects generate a term in the effective action that couples psi either to a spin half fermion lambda that was previously massless or to itself, that's a failure mode of the proof of the supersymmetric ward identity. In the first case, supersymmetry is spontaneously broken with lambda as a Goldstone fermion. In the second case, we land in anti de Sitter space with unbroken supersymmetry. But there's actually going to be a dilaton runaway and uh, perturbative string theory won't work. An example of the first kind is known in superstring perturbation theory, but no example of the second kind is known in any dimension. And I've been wondering if there's a no-go theorem. In, in any event, in many classes of string vacua, typically in a supersymmetric string vacuum, it's straightforward to prove that this failure mode doesn't happen. For example, I'll prove it in all of the 10-dimensional superstring theories. In all of the 10-dimensional superstring theories except 2A, this follows from considerations of space-time chirality, which make it impossible to write the interactions in question. For example, in the heterotic string, this one doesn't exist because psi has definite chirality. So psi bar gamma ij psi is 0. And similarly for the other guy, there's no, in that case, well, I don't want to run over all the details you have to check. But just considerations of space time chirality are enough. For type 2a, you also have to use minus 1 to the f left symmetry to exclude the Roman's mass, which would have been a failure mode. So in 10 dimensions, we get for free uh, the fact that this failure mode doesn't arise. But in most supersymmetric string vacua, you, with slightly more elaborate arguments, reach the same conclusion. So all we need to, in order to land in a happy place is an extension of this type of reasoning to show that the massless, tadpole vanishes, massless tadpoles vanish. Though this is expected to follow from space-time supersymmetry, I believe the argument I gave involving the decoupling of a soft gravitino appears to be not quite powerful enough to prove it, although I keep wondering if I'm missing something. However, given the experience from the old literature, one expects that what one should do is to make a similar argument, but with k set to 0 at the beginning. We use the fact that the vertex operator for a gravitino of polarization eta equals k times zeta, for any k and zeta, is a BRST commutator. But if k is 0, then eta is 0, and therefore v is 0. So the relation becomes that q with s is 0. Or s, which is the limit of w as k goes to 0, is the fundamental spin field of Friedan, Martinik, and Schenker. S has ghost number 1, roughly speaking. Uh, I'm suppressing picture number. Well, a vertex operator for particle emission has ghost number 2. So by analogy with more simple cases, the BRST invariance of S should mean that S generates a, a symmetry in space-time. But the correct way of making that argument is a little bit tricky. And it, 
actually, where it's been stated best in the literature, again, is by Belopolsky. Uh, it's a little bit wrong to try to think of S as a conserved current, because, because of the fact that a Ramon vertex operator is inserted at a superconformal singularity, it doesn't make sense to move it while keeping the other supermoduli fixed. And therefore, it can't be thought of as a conserved current on a fixed super Riemann surface. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain those last two sentences properly today, but they're at the root of the reason that um, trying to avoid a couple of things I've been telling you today um, made the literature in the 80s a little bit untransparent. So instead, we need to make a slightly different argument. And one of the payoffs of making the slightly better argument is it, it will show us how the failure mode can arise. The failure mode is the one that is supposed to arise if supersymmetry breaking actually is triggered by loops. So for practice, since we believe that S is going to generate a symmetry, well, let's look at a correlation function of vertex operators V1 up to Vn of physical string states times the supercurrent S. It can't be integrated over moduli space gamma because the ghost number is too small by one. But because its ghost number is too small by one, it can be integrated over a cycle whose dimension is one less than usual, namely over the boundary at infinity of moduli space. So we integrate this thing over the boundary at infinity, but by Stokes's theorem, that's the same as the integral of d of it over the bulk, but since everything is BRST invariant, that's zero. So something is equal to zero, and that's going to give our ward identity. Now, uh, this vanishing relation can be written as a sum of contributions from the many components of the boundary of gamma. But most of them don't contribute because the momentum flowing through the singularity is off-shell. I'll give you the contributions where the on momentum is on-shell so they can contribute. Since S has momentum zero, if V has momentum zero, this kind of configuration is on-shell because the momentum flowing through is on-shell. So that can contribute. If these are the only non-zero contributions, we get the supersymmetric ward identity as before. In other words, to evaluate this contribution, we would insert over here all these guys times a vertex operator, which we would insert it here, which we would understand as the result of supersymmetry acting on V. So um, <clears throat> if the vanishing theorem receives only contributions of this type, that's going to give us the supersymmetric ward identity. But uh, there is another contribution we should worry about, and it represents the failure mode of superstring perturbation theory. I'm going to write that other contribution in a moment. And we'll skip ahead and discuss, the, finally, the massless tadpole. To discuss the massless tadpole, we replace the product V1 up to Vn with a single vertex operator V lambda of a massless fermion of zero momentum that's related by supersymmetry to a scalar phi whose tadpole we want to understand. So now, okay, our general relation is that the integral over the boundary of moduli space of S times V is zero. And this is now simple because with only two vertex operators, there only are two types of boundary component. And then the two vertex operators are either on the same side or the opposite side of the separating degeneration. Now, this one, which I didn't write before, is the failure mode, where on one component, there's only one vertex operator, namely the supercurrent S. And if it contributes, that's supersymmetry breakdown, because S is creating from the vacuum a massless fermion. So if there's a contribution like that, that means that supersymmetry was spontaneously broken. For example, for the 10-dimensional superstring theories, as I told you, a trivial consideration of space-time chirality shows that that doesn't happen. But we need to know it doesn't happen to prove that superstring perturbation theory works. And when we know that doesn't happen, we're left with only this one contribution on the left, and that contribution is the dilaton tadpole. So precisely when supersymmetry is not spontaneously broken and a cosmological constant is not generated in perturbation theory, we prove that the dilaton tadpole vanishes. So when we know that the graviton can't gain a mass in perturbation theory, for instance, in R10, 
This relation should remove the very slight unclarity that surrounded superstring perturbation theory. Thank you. Thank you for this nice talk. Questions? I'm wondering if you can make any sense of string perturbation theory if, when you generate such a tadpole, you let the dilaton run off to weak coupling as a function of time so that in the far future it would seem that there might be a good perturbative description. Of course, the S matrix is hard to define, so your answer might be no. But. Well, um, I'm going to give you a slightly formal answer. If you can find a conformal field theory whose only problem is weak coupling ends, First, you have to de decide what are the physically sensible observables in such a background. They probably will be, however, the expectation value of an endpoint of physical state vertex operators. For example, in ADS CFT duality, in ADS3, the physical, it was shown by people who investigated that subject that the formal definition of endpoint functions of physical state vertex operators are the right things, <laughs> and their physical interpretation are the boundary observables that make sense in that space time. So I would guess that if you find a field theory background, which is, is, as you said, with no oddities except a dilaton runaway weak coupling, then the formal definition will make sense and will give whatever you should be calculating. And moreover, it will make sense. The, the hard part, I think, is going to be to find the conformal field theory that has the right uh, properties. But I can't hear you, sorry. I can't hear you, sorry. Well, if there's a strong coupling region in the, in the past, then string theory, perturbation theory will not work. Uh, sorry, what Ava asked is the following. I think what she is asking is, is the, will string perturbation theory make sense with the linear dilaton? That's weak coupling in the future and strong coupling in the past. And I'm going to give the purest answer, which is no, because of the strong coupling end. If you can find a way to remove the strong coupling end by somehow compactifying it, cutting it off, removing it with the brain, God knows what. If you can do that, then I would think that the formalism will work. One um, more quick question. Hi. Uh, if, so uh, if you imagine taking uh, 2A or 2B and compactifying on T6, um, then it, it, at least at one loop, there's a zero slope limit, which, which turns these amplitudes into n equals 8 supergravity amplitudes for the massless fields. Um, if this limit made sense at all loops, then it would be an argument for the perturbative finiteness of n equals 8 supergravity. Use, uh, using these methods, do you have any sense that that limit does or doesn't exist? Well, the, again, I'm on, the question is whether the fact that string theory on T6 makes sense it gives any evidence that n equals 8 supergravity makes sense as a purely four-dimensional field theory. Again, I'm only going to give the purest answer, which is no. <laughs> it doesn't. The, the string theory is a more elaborate structure. The question, the question is a special case of the general, following general question. If you have a theory that makes sense and it can be approximated at low energies by some other theory, does that give evidence that the other theory is ultraviolet complete by itself? The generic answer to that is no, and I'm simply not telling you anything except the generic answer. <laughs>